you maybe describe a little bit your Catholic upbringing? I brought with, hmm, I was brought up in a very typical Catholic household. My father came from an Italian family, my mother from an Irish family. And it was post-war, so it was very simple that we, right after the war, there was such a crowd in the baby boom that all of the schools were filled, the Catholic schools, the public schools. I wound up going to a Catholic school that they you know, had a limit of 40 students in the first grade, and I was the 42nd because they were just, it, was, it was filled. But uh, it was a, an upbringing that was very Catholic without being super pious, super religious. There was not a sense that uh, we were holier than anyone else or better than anyone else. It was simply the air we breathed. It was simply part of who we were. Um, we, we joke that, you know, this was in the 50s before Vatican II. Our closest friends were the couple down the street who were, heaven forbid, Lutherans. And uh, it was very brave for them, I guess, to have friends who were Catholics. But it was part of the times. It was who we were. And uh, we went to the Catholic schools. The nuns taught us both how to read and write, but they also taught us science. They taught us the Big Bang. They taught us evolution. They also taught us the great creed of the 1950s, that we had won the war thanks to science. They really meant technology, but they said science. The, the creed that said that all of the problems of the world are going to be solved by, you know, bigger and better factories, bigger and better pills, bigger and better scientific research. And it was a very optimistic time, even though it was, in retrospect, a very naive time. What made you become a scientist? It was impossible, if you were a smart little boy in those days, not to be a scientist. Um, I started kindergarten, I started the first year of schooling, the year that Sputnik went up, you know, and I finished high school the year that people landed on the moon. It was the space age, there was this big push in America that smart kids needed to go into science. In addition to that, however, uh, my dad had always had a fascination with astronomy when he was a kid growing up. And then during the war, he was a navigator in B-17, so he used the stars to, to both fly across the Pacific and the Atlantic. And he taught us astronomy growing up. So astronomy was in the air, and science was in the air. I had a wonderful chemistry set when I was growing up in my basement. Uh, I, every Christmas came little you know, kits on how to build your own computer, how to build your own model automobile, how to build your own model rocket. This was the atmosphere I was brought up in. The interesting thing actually was when I went to high school, now we're talking 1966, suddenly I was told all the smart kids went to Latin and Greek in the classics. And so I happily went into Latin and Greek in the classics because I still wanted to be one of the smart kids. That was the ambition you had when you were young. It was only after I finished as a classics major and was looking at the universities that uh, I chose Boston College because it was a Jesuit school. And I was fascinated by the Jesuits. And I chose history because I wanted to know everything. I thought history would cover everything. My best friend from high school went to MIT, which, if you know Boston, is basically just up the road from Boston College. And I'd visit him every weekend. And I found that it was a much more exciting place to go than studying history at, at Boston College. MIT had weekend movies, MIT had pinball machines, MIT had tunnels where you could explore. It had this sense that things were going on here that might shape the future rather than just studying the past. It also had the world's largest collection of science fiction. And I loved science fiction. So I started hunting around for a way that I could get to MIT and take part in all of that fun stuff. It looked like fun. Um, I applied to transfer. They wanted a major, so I checked off the one that said Earth and Planetary Science because I saw the word planets and I thought, oh, that must be astronomy. It's only when I arrived that I discovered first that that was geology, which was kind of a shock, but then that there are rocks that fall from the sky called meteorites. There is geology going on on other planets. And that tied in with my love of science fiction. You know, to me, Mars is a place where you could have adventures. And so I had fallen into basically living my dream. You also said that you were fascinated by Jesuits. 
Why? When I was in high school, the Jesuits taught me, and they taught me to think clearly, to think carefully, to challenge assumptions, to recognize the assumptions that we make without even thinking about it. They were fantastic scholars, and they seemed to know everything. And I wanted to know everything, and I wanted to be a scholar. But the part of being a Jesuit that I think really resonated with me and does to this day is that they were doing it not to promote themselves as being smarter than everyone else, not to promote themselves as, look at me, I'm the great scholar, buy my book, but rather doing it simply for the love of the knowledge itself. Because let's face it, when you're a Jesuit, you're not doing things for money or prestige or power or to get girls. You're doing it for a different reason, for a reason outside yourself. And I was in love with that, and still am. What generated faith in your youth? Or in your, I mean, you were Catholic, yeah. but anyhow. It's, it's fascinating to wonder, where does the faith come from? I do know this, that if I claimed not to believe, I'd be lying to myself. I don't know where the faith comes from. It was part of me from the beginning. I never had any great you know, crisis of faith in my religion. I did have a crisis of faith in science. When I was a postdoctoral fellow and my scientific career was falling apart and I was subjected to a lot of infighting among other scientific peers and, and a lot of uh, people who are not fighting about what is true, but rather who gets the credit, I was beginning to lose my faith in science and what it stood for. And that's when I joined the Peace Corps and got interested in doing other things. But I never lost my faith in my faith. And every time I would think about or encounter the idea of, well, I could let this go, I could, it would occur to me, why would I want to do this? Why would I want to deny something that I know in my heart is true? What am I getting out of it? And wouldn't that be dishonest? But it does mean that I'm very sympathetic to people who don't have faith because I know why I believe. It's because I'm crazy. And I can't imagine why so many other people believe unless we're all crazy the same way. Uh, it certainly seems much more rational to say, well, if I didn't have to worry about right and wrong, I could go off and do what I wanted to do. I, the fact of the matter is, you know, by the time you hit my age, you realize uh, the stuff that looks so tempting never satisfied. It's at the end of the day, the church isn't out there telling you, don't do that. The church is out there telling you, don't do that. <laughs> You're not going to like that. And they've been right. How difficult was it for you to combine those two? Because of the way I grew up, because it was my parents who were both college educated, assuming that we all would go to college and all of my siblings and I have, you know, more than one degree. Even my, my hippie brother has a master's degree. Um, because I grew up in a household where religion was taken matter-of-factly. Because I was taught science by first the, the good nuns in my grade school and then the Jesuits in my high school, it never occurred to me that there would be a problem. I think I learned early on that faith is not a big book of facts and science is not a big book of facts and you have to worry if one book doesn't agree with the other because I could see that both of them are conversations, both of them are encounters with the truth. And you want more than one way to encounter the truth before you can have any faith in what you're believing in. But still, you see that people somehow experience, let's say, the divergence between science and religion. It, I think one of the hardest things in my job as a scientist who is also a person of faith and who has the job of talking about this in public, is that fundamentally I have no idea why anyone would think there was a conflict between science and faith. I have a really hard struggle putting myself in their shoes, trying to figure out what conflict are they seeing? The, the thing is this, my faith is not the same thing as my science. My faith is what gives me the courage the faith, if you will, to do the science. Science itself is such an unlikely proposition. 
I mean, how do you know that I'm not just, you know, a butterfly dreaming that I'm a philosopher, like, like the, the Chinese philosopher once put it? How do I know that there actually are laws of physics to be discovered or that stupid me is going to be bright enough to even understand them? How do I know that this physical universe is so good that it's worth my life studying it, even though it's not going to make me rich or famous or get me girls? Those acts of faith come out of my son, of re, those acts of faith come out of my religion. It's my religion that says God made this universe and it's real and it's good. It's my religion that says no, there aren't nature gods. No, there isn't a god of lightning that explains all the lightning bolts and another god of, of crops that explains the, the, the growth of crops. But rather, the one god, the only god, is not a nature god, is outside of the universe who made this universe, deciding to make it with rules and deciding to be able to share those rules with human beings on Earth and, and who knows what other aliens out there also doing science. And that we're not only given the power to, but we're encouraged to, that this is our meaning in life, to get to know the Creator through the clues that he scattered in all the rules of the universe. But you could argue that, let's say, one part of your life is collecting data and, and um, researching mm -hmm. reality, whatever mm -hmm. that might, may be. And the other one is based on living in faith, which is... And so, it, yeah, it's... I know people, and I know Catholics who are scientists, who seem to have you know, their faith on Sunday and do their science the other six days of the week. That's not the way I live. It's never been the way I live. Every act of science is an act of worship. Every moment in the lab where I see things come together is a moment of prayer when I hear God say, yeah, that's it. And every moment when I'm by myself thinking about the Lord and thinking about my relationship, I'm also thinking about the physical me in this physical world dealing with a God who made this world. And as a Christian, one who not only made the world, but became part of it. So he gets what I'm going through because he was here too. Um, it's, that's what makes Christianity different from any other religion. That's what makes it, I think, a fabulous religion for a scientist because it's incarnational. It means that uh, the baby who's trying to figure out where his toes are is exploring just like a scientist and that our God also was that baby. Are you saying that as a person or are you saying that as a, well, let's say the chief astronomer? Or <laughs> you know, and I'm not just saying this because, you know, I've got the job to say it. I think I got the job to say it because I've been saying it all along. Um, the, the funny thing was, you know, I didn't become a Jesuit until I was nearly 40. And so I was out there doing my science and being a Catholic all along long before I was being paid to do it. And a lot of the things I'm saying now, I could have said as a lay person. I have now a lot of friends who I know are Catholics, a lot of scientists. The funny thing was when I became a Jesuit, they came out of the woodwork and told me about their faith. I didn't know they were Catholic. They didn't know I was. It's the kind of thing you don't talk about because you don't want to feel like you're imposing your religious beliefs on other people. But... Everything I'm saying, when I hear from my lay people who are, you know, everything that I'm saying when I hear from my friends who are lay people, lay Catholics and also scientists, it's not that I'm giving them great insights. It's rather, yeah, yeah, that's what I've always wanted to say. The difference between being a Jesuit and being a lay person is that they gave me the training to give me the vocabulary to express what I'd been thinking all along. Still, you can say that many people don't perceive the church as being, let's say, at least um, science friendly. It has There's, a bad right. reputation. In yeah. that um, it's funny, the church has a very odd reputation when it comes to science. And one thing I know, scientific research shows this, you can't counter myths by trying to give counter proofs. All I can say is, look at me, here I am, I'm being paid by the church to do more science than NASA ever paid me to do. 
um, if you're going to say the church is anti-science and I'm doing better now than I was being paid by NASA, are you saying NASA is anti-science? I mean, read your history and you realize that's not the case at all. When you do hear that reputation, you have to ask yourself, where's that coming from? Who's trying to sell you that idea? Who's trying to sell you the idea that the church is anti-science? Um, dig through the literature. Find out where that came from. Curious thing. Here at the Vatican Observatory, we've got a great collection of books. The Vatican Library dumped on us all of their science books that we moved out here. All the modern science books, which is to say, printed with a printing press. We've got the Philosophical Transactions going back to 1665. You pull out a book of the Philosophical Transactions, the scientific papers of the 17th and 18th century, even the 19th century, and you look at who's doing science in those days. We're talking after Galileo. We're talking after Newton. The people who are doing the science are either noblemen or clergymen. Because let's face it, who else in those days had the education and the free time to do the science? But so many great things in science were promulgated by the reverend this, the reverend that. So much of the, the, the scut work of doing the science, collecting the data, organizing the data, publishing the data. You know, what do we call collecting and organizing and publishing pieces of paper with data on them and putting them in filing cabinets? In English, we call it clerical work. Why is it called clerical? Because it was done by clerics. Because this is the work you were trained to do when, you know, you were running a parish. You were keeping track of births and deaths and whatever. And that's the same way that you collect scientific data. These were the people who were trained to do it. And they were trained to do it because they were also trained to have the love of creation and the curiosity about creation to do it. The idea that the church and science are at war with each other goes back only to the end of the 19th century. And I suspect a lot of it goes back to the eugenics movement where the church was opposed to the idea that you could breed superhuman beings and you should eliminate all of those who were inferior. And people said, ah, oh, but science, but, but, you know, Darwin has told us. Well, Darwin didn't say that. That's not what evolution was. Eugenics was a horrible idea. It also happened to be a false idea. But we forget that. And we forget that so much of what we call modern science has this uh, less than savory origin. The other thing is, you could say people um, face creationists, face people who are mm -hmm. think that the Earth is six thousand years yeah. old, that this has been created mm -hmm. in three days, you know, six days. Sorry. Um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> whatever. But, but anyhow, <laughs> which people which yeah. are opposing evolution, yeah, right? Um, that's that's the sort of picture that people have from well, the church and science. Yeah. Anybody who's not a member of a church probably thinks that church people are what you see on TV. Sorry, guys, you guys who are making this TV film, but the way that religion has been portrayed on television is not the most accurate. The way that science has been portrayed is not the most accurate. So who are you getting on television but the really, really extreme wackos of the religious fundamentalists and the equally extreme wackos of the science fundamentalists most of the religious fundamentalists, frankly, aren't very religious. Most of the science fundamentalists, frankly, aren't very good scientists. They're not doing the science anymore. They're talking about it. They're being on TV about it. And as someone who's now on TV doing science, I realize it's hard to continue doing your research. It makes for great television, but it's not the truth. The fascinating thing is, if you look at scientists across the globe, the proportion of scientists who go to church are pretty much the same as the proportion in their community, whether they're scientists or not. You know, I'd say 50% of the scientists I know in Chicago, maybe 10% in Great Britain. But that's pretty much who goes to church. The people who want to be known as scientists, the people who are so insecure in their scientific ability that they're desperate for the reputation of being scientists, are the ones who are the public atheists. Most of them are elderly white males, by the way, which I've got nothing against being an elderly white male myself. Most of the people who are in public waving that they are religious, super religious, look at me, I'm religious, generally are not religious. 
because that's exactly what Christianity is not supposed to be. You know, Lord, read the Bible, read the New Testament. You know, if you're parading yourself as being religious, you're not religious. If you're out there claiming to be holier than thou, if you're out there claiming that I have earned my faith, that I have earned my salvation by being a literalist following all the rules, well, the first rule of St. Paul in his letters is don't think that following rules is going to earn you salvation. That's not how it happens. So, in fact, you say it does differ per sort of religion. The, the minority religion you see out there that claims you know, the world had to be 6,000 years and you have to believe that, that's not traditional Christianity, never has been. You can find quite the contrary in the Church Fathers from Roman times, in Augustine, in Aquinas, in, indeed, most of the great Protestant writers. That idea really comes out of a small segment, I hate to say it in America, of uh, people who descended from what they used to call the Great Awakening, who were generally very poorly educated people in the frontier who didn't have a whole lot of other ideas to interact against who had churches that consisted mostly of them and their neighbors preaching the same thing to each other, who had only one book, the Bible, and didn't have much of an education about how to read it. Uh, and they're very sincere, and they're wonderful people, and they're trying to do their best, but they're afraid to let themselves be challenged by the reality that God and the universe are a whole more complicated than that. So let's talk a little bit about the complication of the universe. Um... You have been studying meteorites, have been studying actually, mm -hmm. well, old matter from the universe. Mm -hmm. um, if you go back in, in, let's say, the history of astronomy, um, our place in the, in the universe has become smaller and smaller and smaller. What do you uh, think? It's fascinating. People have this great idea of what the medieval view of the universe was. And I think maybe it comes out of reading a lot of fantasy. I have a much clearer sense now of what the medieval view really was. And this was described actually by C.S. Lewis in a book called The Discarded Image. People think of Lewis as the guy who wrote the Narnia children's books, but he had a day job. He was a scholar of classical literature. In the medieval view, the earth was not the center of the universe. The earth was the bottom of the universe. And in fact, the center of the earth, which would be even more central if you wanted to think of it that way, was the inferno, was hell. So clearly that didn't mean it was an exalted place. The idea of humanity's place in the universe has changed in the sense that we now understand how big the universe is, but it really hasn't changed in a theological sense because before the Enlightenment, before the humanist movement, in medieval times, in classical times, human beings were just one of a whole range of species, mythical species, invented species, analogical species, whether you're talking about the monsters in the Iliad and the Odyssey, or the angels and the stars singing for joy that you find in the Psalms. The human being, the human race, was only a part of this much bigger universe. And our religion is certainly big enough to encompass all of that. It's only the Enlightenment that tried to narrow it down, the same Enlightenment that didn't believe in meteorites because it didn't fit their worldview. But still, you could say that we have discovered that we are just a speck in an immense universe. I don't know. I think the human race, I think a human being can only accept so much immensity in their imagination. Um, you go out to the Great Plains and you see nothing for as far as the eye can see. It's, it's kind of frightening. You go anywhere where there's only mountains in the distance and you see the dome of the sky overhead, which is what we all see. And then you're told in Genesis that bigger than what we can see is the God who made all of this. And that already makes you feel pretty darn small. If you see a universe that's now 13.8 billion light years to the edge of what we can observe, possibly 150 billion light years to the edge of what was in contact with us before the, you know, the great inflation, possibly infinite, possibly one of an infinite number of multiverses. 
It doesn't make us any smaller. It just makes God a lot bigger. But it makes us be, let's say, small, small in terms of the universe. We've always been small in terms of the universe. We've always been the smallest thing we can see in relationship to so much that we could see even when all we thought the universe was was the valley that we were in. We were still in our imagination. We were still in our imagination, surrounded by monsters, surrounded by the unknown, surrounded by the great forest or whatever. This has always been a part of who we were. You can look at it two different ways. You can say, I'm so tiny and the universe is so big, how could God possibly notice me? Or you could say, I'm so tiny, the universe is so big. How much even bigger God must be that he does notice me. You could say, um, why are we as humans so special then? Why are we, the human race, special in the universe? Well, we're special in this way, you know, compared to the chair I'm sitting on. In me, the universe is able to reflect on itself. In you, the universe is able to reflect on itself. Every little baby has to come to grips with the fact that there are other babies in the universe besides themselves. But after a while, they decide this is a really great idea. And when they grow up, they make more babies. That's great. Every self-aware entity in the universe, whether we're the only ones out there or the place is teeming with them, we are the part of the universe where the universe becomes self-reflective where the universe is able to choose to love or not love its neighbor. And maybe that's not the case of us being special because I'm different from the chair, but rather it's a case of me being special because I'm characteristic of what this universe is all about. That this sense of being self-reflective is why creation exists. And it will be true long after I'm dead long after the human race is gone, when there will be nothing but, you know, intelligent cockroaches on some far distant planet, doesn't matter. If they are able to love, if they are able to be aware of themselves and the other entities, if they are free to not love, then they will be in a relationship with the universe that is self-reflective, that is akin to what I'm living in right now. And it's characteristic of what all places and all times would have. Fact, it is the image and likeness of God. And in fact, you're saying we are the mind of the universe. I am in the universe. I am a part of the universe. And in me is a mind that is able to reflect on the universe. So I am a part of the universe, a part of the mind of the universe, and a part that's not being assimilated like some great Borg into all one giant mind but I'm one of billions and billions of minds in the universe. So if we can go back in time and we go to the Big Bang, mm -hmm. um, of course you end up with the question, what created? What created the, the Big Bang? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. The idea of the Big Bang came out of the mathematics of general relativity, and it was really devised as a cosmology by a mathematician from Belgium, a fellow by the name of Georges Lemaitre, who was a postdoctoral fellow with uh, Al, uh, um, Arthur Eddington, the guy whose observations confirmed relativity, and who got another doctoral degree from MIT. Georges Lemaitre also happened to be a Catholic priest. And most of the other cosmologists of his time, you know, Fred Hoyle being the great example, were very skeptical of his idea because they thought, ah, you're coming up with the idea of a starting point as a way of recovering Genesis. And, and Lemaitre said, no, it's in the mathematics. Show me where the math is wrong and I'll change my mind. Uh, and Hoyle, to his credit, saw that the mathematics wasn't wrong, saw the evidence of you know, the black body radiation and eventually came to believe in the Big Bang. A thousand years from now, who knows what we're gonna believe. But what Lemaitre also recognized is that the creation point of the Big Bang is not God creating out of nothing. That's not the same thing. Stephen Hawking, a few years ago, came up with this book that said, ah, 
I understand how the Big Bang occurred. It was a quantum fluctuation in the primordial gravity field. And you know, wait long enough, you had infinite time, it's going to be big enough to start a universe. Therefore, I don't need God to start the Big Bang. Now think about it. He's saying that the God he was looking for is the thing that started the Big Bang. And then he says, gravity is the thing that started the Big Bang. Logically, he's not proving there's no God. Logically, he's proving that God is gravity, which is silly. On the other hand, maybe that's why he thinks Catholics celebrate Mass. Bad joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice joke. Uh, now, the, the, I, the phrase, why is there something instead of nothing, is usually attributed to Leibniz. And the idea that creation is creation out of nothing is an idea that goes back to the book of Maccabees in the, the Old Testament. It's an interesting thought that it's not something proposed by a philosopher. It's not something proposed by a priest. In the book of Maccabees, there's a mother who's encouraging her children when they're about to be killed by the evil king. And she says to her youngest, don't be afraid. Our God, the God who is with us, is the God who created the universe out of nothing. Just sort of tossed off as an aside. And it's one of the most profound ideas in, in modern philosophy. But by, mo but by nothing, we don't mean a vacuum. Because we get from relativity, even space itself, even time itself, is an existence that can be you know, warped to make mass or not mass, that has in it more than nothing. By nothing, we mean even the absence of space, even the absence of time and that we believe in a God, not who is a God in nature, but a God who is supernatural. And to really appreciate what that means, I don't mean just that he, you know, he's not the God of lightning. He is a God who is enough outside of the universe that he can give the universe meaning. Now, this is an idea that Wittgenstein had that the meaning for something only exists outside the thing. The reason for the chair I'm sitting on is not contained in the chair. It's contained in the thing outside the chair that's you know, using the chair to sit on. The reason for the universe cannot be found in the universe. When Steven Weinberg says, the more I look at the universe, the more it appears to be meaningless. Well, of course, because you're not going to find the meaning of the universe in the universe. And even that's not a new idea. That goes back to the book of Ecclesiastes, where the, the, it starts out, you know, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless, or vanity of vanities, the way most people know it. Um, this is a, a great translation I owe to uh, Jonathan Sachs, the, the former chief rabbi in Britain. In order to have a universe with meaning, you have to believe in something outside the universe. Now, you can believe in a universe without meaning and then go on and live that way. And I can't disprove it. But what I can say is that by starting with the assumption there is a meaning to this universe, a meaning to my life, a meaning to why I want to do the things I do, I can come up with a system that is completely self-consistent and aesthetically pleasing and beautiful and gives me the energy to do the things that I love doing anyway. Does it prove it's true? Of course it doesn't prove it's true, it's what I'm assuming. But it's an assumption that works. But you could argue, what's the meaning of meaning, or yeah. what's the meaning of God? And so you could ask, you know, you could try to go meta and meta and meta, and you go on infinitely. So that's a pretty fruitless way of reasoning as far as I'm concerned. Um, if you want to be that sort of philosopher, go right ahead and have a good time, if having a good time is what you find your meaning in. What kind of parallels do you see uh, between science and religion? There are two ways that I think you can talk about the parallel between science and religion. In a philosophical sense, uh, there's an interesting anti-parallelism that Science is a human creation invented by human beings. So it can be understood, even if not all of my students understand it at first, it is in theory understandable. 
but it's only an approximation of the truth. And we keep working at science to make that approximation better and better and better. It'll never be perfect. Science is understanding, seeking truth. Religion starts with truths. I exist. The universe exists. What am I going to do about this? I don't understand the truths. And I'm forever in my religious life trying to get to a deeper and deeper understanding of God. So science is understanding, seeking truth. Religion is truth, seeking understanding. Naturally, it looks like they're, they're parallel, but in some ways they're the opposite, which is why it's ridiculous to try to substitute the one for the other uh, in either direction. The other great thing of the parallel between science and religion to me is that in practice, both of them are subjects that only flourish in a community. Every day, I get letters and emails from cranks and crackpots who have invented some new way of inventing the universe that proves that everything we've known, but, you know, we get them all the time. And it's very sad because, you know, they want to get in on the fun of studying the universe, but they're not part of the conversation. They don't know what the words mean to those of us who are part of that conversation. They don't know what's already been done. They don't know where the conversation is. It's kind of like being at a party and seeing three or four people having a great conversation and walking up and trying to jump in by telling a joke that has nothing to do with what they're talking about. It, it, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's sad. It's not where things are. You have to be part of the community to really take part in science. And that means you have to jump through the hoops. That means, yeah, you got to go to the schools. Yeah, you've got to get the degrees so that people have confidence that when you say something, it's worth their while to stop and think about what you're saying. There are the rare geniuses who can contribute, but they only are able to do that by spending the time learning the language and finding out what are the questions that people happen to be interested in this year. And it does mean that, yeah, you could, you know, find an Einstein in the 17th century, and Einstein in the 17th century would have been worthless because no one else in the 17th century would have known what he was talking about. The same is true in religion. You can have a person who has this phenomenal understanding of the divine, but in practice, if you really want to work at understanding God, it's really useful to have a lot of other people to compare notes with because... 50% of what you're going to come up with on your own is going to be absurd. And you need someone there to say, no, you're getting weird. Pull back. No, that doesn't work because, or wait a minute, here's something that happened to people a thousand years ago, a hundred years ago, last year. And maybe this fits into how do you understand God? Your answers are too simple. Let's go deeper. You need a community to do that. And a community means structure and structure means organization an organization means all of the headaches that come with bureaucracy. So every scientist will complain about big science. And every scientist will complain about, you know, all the hoops you have to jump through to get a grant from NASA or the National Science Foundation or ESA or whoever is paying you to do the science. And every religious person knows the difficulty of dealing with the big bureaucracy that's sitting there to try to figure out everything from who's going to bring, you know, cookies and milk to the Sunday school to how are we going to decide that this person really is qualified to preach on Sunday and this other person is mostly making stuff up. It's not easy. And mistakes are always made in bureaucracies. But we're human beings. We always make mistakes. And in the long run, you put up with the big church for the same reason you put up with the big science because it's the best way that we have found so far to carry on the conversation and to bring the fruits of the conversation on to the next generation in an organized way, in a transparent way, in a way that everyone can agree, yeah, this person went to MIT. They may be goofy, but at least I can trust that they learned the same science we all learned. And this person you know, went to the theological school and it may be goofy, but at least we know that they've learned the language. And you don't trust any one scientist, and you don't trust any one preacher. You have a community of people who 
have literally built the church brick by brick, who have literally built the lab by creating the instruments that I could never create to make the measurements that I need to make to add to the conversation. But you describe it as to, well, let's say intellectual communities. And certainly both science and religion are intellectual communities, but they're more than that. One of the great things about being an astronomer in particular is that not only do I have all these astronomers who I get to meet at meetings, I've also got a world of amateur astronomers who don't have the scientific degrees, but they've read the books and they can make their contribution and they can share in the fun of the stuff that we come up with. And even better than that, anyone who's ever been able to go outside and look at the stars can share in the fun. Wonderful thing happened when I joined the Peace Corps and they sent me to Africa and I would go up country into the most remote villages, places where people were living, you know, in glorified huts. They had the same joy of looking at the stars. I'd set up the telescope and they had the same questions. What am I looking at? Isn't that marvelous? Or is that real? Saturn really has rings? This is something that's unifying all human beings. And I think the same is true of religion. You don't have to be an intellectual genius to be a saint. You don't have to be a giant to be able to appreciate God's love in a very personal and a very immediate way. But if your talent happens to be your intellect, there's a place for you as well. So let's talk a little bit about, um, there are peculiar things in faith, um, for example, miracles. Right. Um, which do not fit into the scientific picture. Ah, miracles. What What's about a miracles? miracle? What's a miracle? Yeah. Everybody's idea of a miracle now that we're, you know, in, in the 21st century. A miracle is a violation of the laws of physics. Um, there were miracles that were called miracles long before there were laws of physics. Long before people ever had heard of laws of physics or even had heard of physics. What did they mean by miracles? A miracle is not something that's impossible, necessarily. It doesn't have to be. Let me give you an example. Um, I get this from, from my friend Paul Muller, who I wrote this book with uh, about miracles and many other things. Imagine you've got a cousin, a cousin Tony. Cousin Tony hates cats. He's a dog person. And one day you go to his house and he's got a kitten and he's going goo goo over the kitten. He's going crazy over the kitten and you're going, all right, something's going on here. Something new is happening. You know, maybe he's got a new girlfriend who likes cats. You know, maybe he's had a stroke. Who knows? Something has happened here. Now, there's nothing against the law of physics for your cousin Tony to be petting a cat. But it's contrary to everything you've seen up to now. It's something unusual and different that's telling you something. A miracle is an unusual event that points you to God. It could be, you know, a coincidence, a divine coincidence. It could be the power of God manifesting itself in a way that you don't normally see. Um, but that's something the party, you believe. The, you believe uh, that God is acting in this world. And that. so... The amazing thing is that you do believe God acts in the world, but you recognize that God acts in ways that are often subtle, are often through the arrangement of coincidences, um, that often may appear to be a violation of causality, but guess what? We know causality is not the final word in, in physics anymore. And it reminds you that there's more going on in our lives and the way we live than the science I happen to have at this moment in this year. Uh, it's one of the joys of modern physics is to humiliate ourselves a little bit. We thought we had it all figured out and now we figured out enough to know we don't have it all figured out. But I don't even want to say that miracles are fitting into quantum uncertainty or you know wherever the mystery of the moment is. We also know that's bad philosophy. Rather, Science is one glorious dimension of the universe, but not the only dimension. Just as science can explain all of the pigments on the Mona Lisa, but science cannot describe why the Mona Lisa has the meaning it has to the Western world. 
Um, and some miracles are where people are inspired to act in ways that you would never expect them to do. Rosa Parks, you know, refusing to give up her seat in the bus that sparks the civil rights movement in America. Sometimes miracles are coincidences of nature that uh, may or may not have a divine origin. The, the parting of the Red Sea. Maybe it was just like in the movies with, you know, Charlton Heston making the, these walls of water. Maybe it was an extremely unusual but possible coincidence of weather patterns that allowed a dry path. For you. It doesn't matter. The point was it happened when it needed to happen. And it happened at a point where people of religion were asking, God help us. And suddenly there was the help. It was a sign that points to God. What, in fact, does a, let's say, the chief officer of the mm -hmm. Vatican Astronomy uh, Observatory right. do? What's my job here at the Vatican Observatory? I'm still figuring this one out, and uh, I've been on the job less than a year. I suspect if I've been on the job 10 years, I'd still be figuring it out. To my mind, I have really the responsibility of fulfilling the mission of the observatory. And the mission was given to us by Pope Leo XIII when he founded it in 1891. And he said he wants to show the world that the church... Let's start and he it says, yeah. yeah. What I'm trying to do as the head of the Vatican Observatory is to fulfill the mission that Pope Leo XIII gave us in 1891, to show the world that the church supports good science. So there's two elements to that. Do good science. When I arrived here 25 years ago, the director looked me in the eye and said, here's your job, do good science. Now I'm the director, my job is to go around to each of the other Jesuits here and say, here's your job, do good science. The other half is to show the world, to remind my fellow Catholics that science is a wonderful gift of God and a way of getting to know God, not something to be afraid of, but something to be embraced. And the church encourages us to embrace it. And church universities are at the forefront of doing science and teaching science. Also, it's to make sure that the other Jesuits here who are the scientists, who are the researchers, have what they need, whether it's a good, clean office the best computer that we can afford, access to other scientists because nobody works alone. So I wanna make sure they get to the scientific meetings so they can work with their colleagues. Whatever it takes to do good science in the 21st century. I suppose you also reflect on more than only, let's say, astronomy. Um, there are a lot of, let's say, moral issues, science and technology, mm -hmm. we are a sort of yeah. technological creature in fact mm -hmm. we are producing things um, that we sometimes even don't understand yeah um, let's for example say we create artificial intelligence mm -hmm. could an artificial intelligent creature believe have faith right uh, people will ask me about artificial intelligence for example as an idea of, of the technology of the future and would there be a moral dimension to it when I was an undergraduate at MIT, my roommate worked in the artificial intelligence lab. Uh, you know, I got to know Marvin Minsky. I got to know uh, Winston. I got to know a lot of the greats, you know, Seymour Papert. And I've always been fascinated by it. I'm a science fiction fan. To my understanding of theology, the image and likeness of God, the, the nature of what we sometimes call the soul, has two aspects, intellect, free will, the ability to be aware of oneself and others, and the freedom to act on that knowledge. I don't think that an entity could be considered truly in the image and likeness of God if it only had one and not the other. If you have freedom without intellect, you know, which uh, sometimes makes me think of a cat, though cats might argue. Um, a computer that was self-aware but didn't have the freedom to do anything about it would be missing something. But if you've got the two, um, doesn't matter how many tentacles or how many transistors, whatever it is, 
that allows you to be that entity. That said, I'm not so sure it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, as I say, I've been watching the field for 40 years. And interesting thing, when I was a Jesuit novice, they had me working in a sheltered workshop for men who were severely mentally retarded. Um, wonderful men, but they were not capable of you know, living on their own. Many of them could not count past three. Funny thing is, they could all speak English just fine. What's going on in that kind of brain is very different from what's going on in a computer. And while the human brain is very complex, more complex than a computer nowadays, complexity is not the same thing as intelligence. Complexity is not the same thing as self-awareness. And that's why we continue to explore what is consciousness? What is self-awareness? Where are the physical analogs? Um, it's very tempting to want to say that there's a spiritual side because the picture then is as Casper the ghost sort of settling into the, the... And I think that's a false picture, and I think that could be a dangerous picture. But sheer materialism misses the point as well. If you've got a computer that's exactly identical in model to my computer, the only thing that's different is the, the, the O's and zeros on your hard drive. But those O's and zeros only have meaning in terms of what they put on the screen. And the screen only has meaning because there's a human being looking at the screen and interpreting them. Otherwise, how could you say that one computer is different from the other? And yet they are. They are because of the meaning that we attach to the things we see on the screen that come from the ones and zeros on the hard drive. And so meaning exists outside of the thing that we're looking at. And yet it is real. But still you didn't answer my question because actually, is it conceptually possible that a machine might have faith? What's a machine? Is it possible that a machine it's could have faith? Is it possible that right. a... Okay, here's, here's, here's where I'm getting. What's a machine? Is it conceptually possible that a machine could have faith? This is the question. And we think of machine as bits of, of metal, but you know, you could also look at you know, the, the, the wetware sitting here talking at you. In one sense, I'm a collection of chemicals. I'm a big chemical machine. I'm a really fabulous chemical machine because I can do things that I couldn't design from scratch right now. Maybe in a hundred years or a thousand years, someone will. Um, I have faith, therefore it's possible to have faith. I'm not ruling out the sense that a physical collection of atoms can become a thinking, breathing, understanding, self-aware human being, because a physical collection of atoms becomes that with every child. There is an interesting argument in modern theology about the nature of the soul. When you look deeply into theology, you realize soul was a shorthand invented by Greek philosophers that was adopted by Christianity, and it's not there originally in, in, the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, you, know, you try to find it in the letters of Paul, and he doesn't divide a human being into body and soul. There is a, a philosopher... Maritana or somebody, I'm not sure who, who, who draws the contrast between the Greek philosopher Socrates, who says, well, I'll drink the poison because I know I've got an immortal soul, so it doesn't really matter. And Jesus Christ, who is faced with death and sweats blood over it, because to the Christian, this life actually does matter. This physical being does matter. Our existence is physical. We are not apprentice angels, in the words of John Polkinghorne. A Christian is, in that sense, a materialist. Just as, uh, you know, people will say that uh, all scientists are atheists. Well, no, but as a scientist, I only believe in one more God than Stephen Hawking does. There are many, many versions of God I don't believe in. It's important to reject most gods to be a Christian. It's important to be, at a certain level, a materialist, to be a Christian, because we have to 
recognize the importance of the physical world and of the things we do in this world. So if you define, let's say, an intelligence created out of atoms, um, you are actually saying that it's able to have faith as well. Whatever I, uh, which right. we created is right. being created by something else. I'm, I am a bunch of atoms created by other people, in this case my mother and father. I hope I have intelligence. I know I have faith. I don't see that there is a necessary connection between how one is created, but there is a moral question whether you want to do it that way. Um, there are a lot of forms of artificial uh, insemination which I think are morally very, very shaky. I really worry about people who want to create designer babies. You know, I want my son to be a not basketball star, so I'm going to make sure that he has the genes to do this and that. I think that's an immoral thing to do. But the child created that way is nonetheless a full human being with all the rights and privileges and needs and necessities and possibilities for love, hate, and sin that a human being has and deserving of our love, even if we're appalled at the way that that child came into being. And it's the same for something we created, not out of a human being. Yeah, and that could be some, the same for whether it was created in a test tube, whether it was created inside a computer. And maybe it's not appalling to create life inside a computer. I don't know. Uh, the only real way to explore it, I think, at the present, is to write science fiction about it. To write a story where you have intelligence in a computer and see where it leads and really push the bounds, the what ifs. I'm not sure that very many science fiction writers have done that. They've got something that's dressed up like uh, an intelligent computer, but I'm not sure to what extent they've really explored the full implications of it. A few may have. I think Robert Sawyer worked at it in, in some of his books. Uh, he's you know, someone who doesn't claim to be a believer, but he's got all the same questions I have. When I was young, my father, I, I was raised as a Catholic, um, I had an argument with my father because uh, I said, why wouldn't there be alien life outside the mm -hmm. earth? Mm -hmm. Everywhere, I mean, yeah. the mm -hmm. cosmos is quite large. He argued, no, we are the only planet where it is. Earth. The we funny thing is, someone who argues, you know, from, from religious grounds that... We are the only people, only God could love us. They're not arguing traditional Christianity, they're arguing 18th century humanism, which infused our culture in the 19th century, but which we now know is you know, terribly inadequate. I'd like to say that the, the Enlightenment was the adolescence of human thought, where philosophers picked up every attractive idea that was glorious and pretty and stupid, just like an adolescent. Um, and it's time to be able to say, I see where that's coming from, but you know, there's, it, it's the philosophical version of painting Elvis on black velvet. We've got to get beyond that. Um, and we've got to get beyond thinking that we have the answers. We've got to get beyond, you can't do science if you think you know all the answers, because why then would you look further? You can't be a person of faith if you're not constantly seeking, if you're not constantly on the road and open, yeah, to making mistakes. Because not every idea you're gonna have is gonna turn out to be a good idea. And sometimes the only way to make progress is to turn around and walk backwards, walk down from where you came. Um, do you think, I have the idea that um, all our intelligence in the universe, I mean, the universe mm -hmm. is quite large. Right, yeah. We can say. Mm -hmm. um, and is there a reason why there wouldn't be any intelligence elsewhere in the universe? It's not only a question of would there be intelligence elsewhere in the universe now, but we've also got 13 billion years of history and who knows how many billion years to go in the future. It's a big universe. To, uh, to quote Carl Sagan, if there is an intelligence out there, it sure would be a waste of space. But we don't know. We've never encountered it. And given what we know of physics at the moment, 
The farther away you go into the universe, the greater the odds there will be intelligence, but the harder it will be to ever know or to ever be able to communicate with them simply because of the speed of light problem. It takes a thousand years to get a message and a thousand years to get the message back. What was that? Could you repeat that? We won't know. We don't know at the moment. Um, but I don't see that there is any philosophical argument against it or any theological argument. Again, I, I remind you that the Bible is full of... Oh. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, again... Oh, oh dear. Oh, that's an act of... Um, I, think, I, I think God's trying to stop me from yeah, giving yeah, this answer. Exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, what about uh, other intelligence in the mm -hmm. fast universe? The, uh, the fascinating thing, first of all, is that... It's only in the 17th, 18th, 19th century that people had the idea only human beings mattered. Because before then, the universe was populated with all sorts of creatures, whether they were the demons and the, the, the crazy imagined things of the Iliad and the Odyssey, or the angels of Christian and, and Jewish tradition, you know, the genies in, uh, in, and the jinns in Islamic tradition. There are plenty of other possible ways that creatures can be intelligent and in a relationship with God. And it's already a part of our tradition, so it would be nothing new. The discovery of the new world and the discovery of human beings there reinforced this because it, you know, in the face of the beginnings of the Enlightenment and the, this new way of looking at things, you were suddenly faced with people that, you know, how did they get here? How are they connected? And even there, the church made it clear that these were people who are deserving of hearing the gospel, deserving of being considered equals, deserving of being ordained. And heaven forbid, we now even have a pope from South America, though of Italian ancestry. That's not a problem with traditional theology. It also shouldn't be a problem with uh, any form of human reasoning well, look at this way. The, uh, there, there's a wonderful cartoon from years ago. The, the cartoonist was, was Walt Kelly. And he has two of his characters in a comic strip saying, you know, what if there is life elsewhere? One of them says, either there are more intelligent beings out in the universe than we are, or we are the most intelligent beings in the universe. And either way, it's a sobering thought. <laughs> It's possible. We don't know that. It's fascinating that we haven't learned that and haven't known that. But I look forward to the day when we do meet other intelligences, but I'm not holding my breath. In the meanwhile, life goes on and we have to figure out how to make it happen. The thing I think is interesting to me is if it does happen, uh, people are going to ask, you know, is this going to be the end of the world? Will, will it be the end of religion? Of course, it won't be the end of religion. Nothing that is supposed to be the end of religion has managed to be the end of religion. The fascinating thing is that those who are atheists who claim that finding other life will mean the end of religion are equally balanced by those who say there must be other creations and other races because God wouldn't make an empty universe. Both arguments are specious. And the fact that we haven't found life hasn't convinced the atheists to not be atheists or those believers to not be believers. So it's clearly not even a critical argument. The fact of the matter is, if, you know, the UFOs landed tomorrow, it would be a five-day wonder, and then be, we'd still be worried about, you know, who's going to win the World Cup, because that's what human beings are like. You place sort of God outside the universe. In fact, you call it the supernatural God. What is his role? If God is supernatural, if God is outside the universe, why does God con concern himself with what's going on in the universe? Why does he concern himself with me? It's a deep question because you have to recognize, first of all, the question only makes sense if you recognize that he does, and I believe he does. The question only makes sense in the context that there is a universe that this God created. 
and how interesting that God chose to create a universe. What's going on beyond that and behind that, we can only think about in an analogy with the creations that we human beings make. Why does someone write a novel? Why does someone draw a painting? Why does someone make a piece of music? What is the experience of creation that goes on there? What is the experience that you have when the creation doesn't work very well and you feel horrible or works beyond your wildest dreams? I think having done a piece of creative art like that is the closest way to answer that question, to be creative yourself. In addition, as a Christian, I believe that God not only creates, but so loved creation that God chose to become part of it. That's what the incarnation is about. And that would be, as, as someone once said, like Shakespeare writing a play where there was a character named Shakespeare running around in it. Um, an interesting way to write things, an interesting possibility, because you want to be a part of it. It only works if there are other characters in the play who are not William Shakespeare. Uh, a friend of mine who is a scientist tried to write a, a science fiction novel, and knowing him, I recognize that not only is he the protagonist, he's also the villain, he's also the sidekick, he's also, you know, every character in the book is really just him, thinly disguised. It's not a very good book. It's not a question that has an answer that you can pin down into a soundbite. It's a question that you like to spend time thinking about and pondering and looking more and more deeply into uh, and trying to create. I've tried writing science fiction novels. They're dreadful. I will hope never one will. I mean, I've tried writing a science fiction novel. It's dreadful. I hope nobody ever reads it. But the experience was great because it made me appreciate what you know, writing a novel is about. And I think trying to do creative things like that is a great way of appreciating what, what creation is all about. Is trying to understand God an act of science or an act of faith? Ah, is, is, you know, is, to what extent is science faith? Is theology, some people will say, is the first science. And uh, along with astrobiology, others would argue that it's a science based on something that a lot of people don't believe even exists. It's both. Um, the science part is trying to make it... The science part is trying to make sense of the experience. But science also begins with the experience that you have of looking at nature. And religion also begins with the experience whatever it is in your life, whether it's an event, a child being born, or simply a realization that comes out of the blue while you're having a walk that makes you look at the world in a new way and wonder, what was that all about? Where is this going? Theology is, you know, faith-seeking understanding, but it starts with faith. Faith starts with experience. And both of them start with wondering and with question. There's a, a, a wonderful theologian in America, Anne Lamott, who has made a statement, I think maybe she got from someone else, that the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. If you're sure about something, you don't need faith. But you're never sure about anything. You're never sure about, you know, should I be making this film? Should I be going to that school? Should I have married this person? All of life is making decisions in the absence of certainty. And that's what makes it so much fun. Yeah, so, yeah, you're working to the... Uh, right. so, if there is so, uh, so, so if there is no certainty, mm -hmm. uh, why do we learn? Is it possible that we'll ever reach certainty? Is it possible that we'll ever know everything there is to know, that there will be a theory of everything and then science will be a closed book? Well, there is a kind of science that is a closed book. It's called Newtonian physics. Nobody's doing original research in Newtonian physics anymore. You know why? Because it's an incomplete picture of physics. It's closed. We know where the boundaries are. We know where it doesn't work anymore. You know, at the very small or the very large or things moving near the speed of light. 
now we've got another physics that we don't know the boundaries of that we're trying to work in, whether it's quantum physics or general relativity. Knowledge is like an island. The more you know, the bigger the island. But the bigger the island, the longer the shoreline, the longer the place where your knowledge stops and the great ocean of what you don't know begins. The whole point of learning something is to create new questions, questions that you can ponder and have fun with that you didn't even know were questions before you started the job. So to my mind, a properly functioning science is one that will never run out of questions, that will never reach the ends of its wondering. And I think that's also true of faith. Your understanding of God had better not stop. The more you understand God, the more you'll realize there are sides to God you don't understand. Here's a scary one. I think it's also true of goodness. I think the better a person you are, the more you are aware of your shortcomings, the more you are aware of places where you could be better. So if you think you know it all, it's because your island is really small and your shoreline is very short. If you think you're sure of God, it's because your knowledge of God is really small. And if you think you're perfect, odds are you have no idea of how much there is that you can do to make the world a better place and you a better person in it. Is there a frontier of our knowledge? Of a our frontier? Knowing? A, a, a frontier. A frontier. All of our knowledge is a frontier. The sad thing is that most people stop learning religion and learning science when they're about 10 or 12 years old. You know, maybe you'll go as far as uh, confirmation class. Maybe you'll go as far as the first set of exams. And when you're 10 or 12, all they've taught you is the stuff out of the book. It's like thinking that music is nothing more than learning the scales on the piano. It's not, you never get to the point where you can, you know, play music. You can never get to the point where you can do science. You never get to the point where you can actually live your faith. All you're going to do is to stop when you're 10 or 12. It takes a lifetime to be able to, to be able to play jazz for real, and rather than just repeating the notes that were written down by somebody else. It takes a lifetime to be at the part of science where you have no idea what's going on next. And your biggest question is, now what do I do? And can I find a question that's big enough to be interesting, but small enough that I can actually make progress on it? That's the challenge of a scientist. Can I find a way of being with God that will stretch me and pull me, but not so overwhelm me that I feel completely hopeless and give up? Can I find a way of loving somebody that the love is allowed to grow rather than being unrequited or being you know, the kind of, of pointless passion that just turns off the other person? I think you find the same reflection in every aspect of life. It's always the challenge of knowing where can I go next? What can I attempt next? Where can I make progress next? And some steps are too big for us. I'm not going to jump directly from learning the scales to playing you know, the, the Moonlight Sonata. I'm not going to jump directly from memorizing the equations in my physics textbook to doing original research in string theory. But there's always a next step I can take. And you have another question. My question is um, in how far, it's a very politic question, in how far he is unafhankelijk from his work in the basis of his basis of the Kaan. There's a very conservative stream in how far is he completely unafhankelijk from what he can do? There's a question uh, I noticed here that it's, uh, he has, but actually I find it in the, your book as well, mm -hmm. um, about your independency. How independent can you be of, mm -hmm. let's say, the general opinion? Is there a general yeah. opinion anyway in the church uh, um, towards science, science, towards mm -hmm. scientific uh, evolution, towards scientific knowledge? Right. Um, what is the role of the church in my life, in my science? What mm -hmm. is the role of the church in the life of a Catholic who wants to be a scientist? It's really one of cheerleading. 
there isn't a little group of people who decide what the truth is and we have to come up with that. I've you know, worked at the Vatican long enough to realize that's not how the Vatican works. The Vatican is a pretty dinky place. There are maybe 500 people working there. And uh, their real job is basically trying to run the bureaucracy for an organization that's got a billion ma members. They wouldn't even have the time to do that kind of thing. What's more, when you find someone in the Vatican who's got a bug in their ear on some issue and they want to, to, to push you in one direction or another, that's generally one person and you can outweigh them. And I've never encountered that. I can only see that that has happened historically in the past. Uh, well, there'll be one person or another person who has the microphone for a moment. It, uh, it really doesn't affect the way we do science any more than uh, you know, having a congressman who doesn't believe that the moon landing really happened. There are such congressmen. There are people in every field who are supporting the science who are going to have their own pet ideas and want to push them. I have found so much less of that in the Vatican than any place else I've worked. Um, you know, one of the, even the, the great thing of papal infallibility, when you look up what it really means, it means that even the Pope admits that there are very limited, narrow places where he can speak with authority, and the rest of it he's speaking as, you know, someone who's got an interesting point of view and will be worth listening to, but doesn't claim infallibility. You know, the infallibility is very limited, unlike a lot of bosses I worked with in the past whose thought of, you know, view of infallibility was very different. The fascinating thing is, because our mission is do good science, we're given the freedom to do good science. We're given the encouragement to do good science. The really interesting thing to me is not the reaction of the people in the Vatican who are mostly happy that we do what we do. It's the reaction of those evangelical Christians who I've criticized, the ones who seem to be creationists, the ones who seem to be suspicious of science. A lot of that is what they call the culture wars. You know, they see that modern society is really screwed up and they don't want to be part of it, and they think science is the reason. Well, it's screwed up because of original sin. It'll always have problems. That's the nature of being human. But when they encounter me as a Jesuit doing science, their reaction is not, oh, you're a scientist, how unclean, but rather how wonderful. Because science is something that we all want. When there's a reaction against science, it's often really a reaction against the people on TV who are pushing their view of science and who are you know, making the claim you have to have the same philosophy as me in order to be a scientist. You have to be a communist to be a scientist. You have to be a socialist. You have to be you know, a Republican. It's nuts. You can have any religion or no religion and be a good scientist or a bad scientist. What you have to have is a commitment to the truth and a humility to say, I don't always have the truth, let me find out. But when a religious person encounters a scientist who's a person of faith, to them it's wonderful, because that's really what they've been looking for. There, there's a museum in America called the Creation Science Museum, and it's a lot of this right-wing, odd creationism view of the world. Nothing that I would accept, nothing that I would believe is good science or good theology. But think for a minute about the fact that they would call it creation science. It's because even they want the cachet of the word science. They're hungry for knowledge, which is what you know, the word science comes from, to know, scientia. And that's a human hunger. That's one of the things that makes us human. And you find it not only in the intellectuals at Oxford, you find it in the Baptist churches of the Bible Belt. You find it in the villages in Africa. You find it in the people whose political views are exactly the opposite of yours and therefore obviously wrong. All human beings have a curiosity, a desire to know, a hunger for the truth. As a religious person, I identify this with the hunger for God the God who is the way, the truth, the life. But even if you don't accept that, it's clear that that is a characteristic of what makes a human being different from a very clever cat.
It's not curiosity that kills the cat. It's curiosity that drives a human being. What has been your most knowledgeable thought? <laughs> oh, I can much more easily tell you what are the times I've been the most stupid. Those are the ones that stand out. Uh, the whole journey of science is not being smart and coming up with the right answers. It's often having the right answers for the wrong reasons or making completely understandable but ultimately totally stupid mistakes. Science proceeds and progresses by its mistakes. You can't be afraid to make mistakes because then you're afraid to do the science. But still, what do you consider your best scientific thought? Then? Oh my. If you had asked me five years ago what my best piece of science was, I would have quoted a paper I published in 1977 on the origin of uh, meteorites from asteroid Vesta. The trouble is, in the last five years, I found out I was wrong. And I'm real proud of the paper that shows that the previous paper was wrong. But, you know, if I work in the field another 10 or 15 years, I may find out what was wrong with the paper I published now. Uh, that's not how you, how you mark progress in science. Rather, you know, for that matter, we all honor Galileo and Kepler and Newton, but scientists don't use their books to do science. Contrary to, say, the way that a philosopher might go back to Plato or Aristotle, the knowledge that's in science is cumulative and progresses, but by that very nature throws the old stuff up behind. Knowledge in ethics and philosophy is not cumulative in that way. We human beings have to make the same ethical decisions that Socrates had to make. And we can't rely on the fact that Socrates already made that decision for us. Whereas as scientists, I don't have to work out Newton's laws of physics. No, Newton already figured that one out. Science is a different sort of beast than a theology or a philosophy in that sense.